This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish, welcome to the show. Up on this episode we continue our run of reviews looking at the 80 Films Italian Collection series. This is the 82nd disc and we will be looking at none other than Iron Warrior, a movie that I had not seen until watching for this review. So we'll be giving you all the deets, all the stuff that comes with special features and all that jazz after the first break, but more importantly, a review of this particular movie, uh, safe to say, a very blatant um, rip-off of Conan, Star Wars, and Indiana Jones. So, don't believe me, watch it, and you'll be able to point out exactly, maybe a little bit of He-Man, but I don't know if He-Man was out when this movie came out. We'll find out. We'll find, ladies and gents. Time is a flat circle. We'll find out. But yeah, that's what we're doing. We're doing a review of Iron Warrior. It's the eighty-second instalment. This, I think, is as far as I've bought up in the collection. So I'll need to double check to see where we are now. the The day of this recording is the fourth of June. So we're probably quite far along, and they probably announced a few titles. Eighty-eight films have been going back through, re-releasing older ones in the collection as four K UHD releases. Some of which have caught my eye, and some of which I'll never buy on 4K UHD because, why? You know, it gets to that point where you're like, I mean, you're stripping a bit of the charm from the movie if I can see and count the guy's nostril hairs when the camera's close to it. So, we're, we will be buying some of those. I won't be going back to do reviews of 4K UHD titles where I replace them. We're only moving forward, so the next one in this series after this will be disc number 83, whatever that may be. So, with that in mind, we're going to take our first break of this episode. You are going to see the trailer for Iron Warrior. When we return, we are discussing that movie, giving you the finer details from what is on this release. And, of course, more importantly, getting to the nitty-gritty of is it actually any good? We'll be doing that right after this. Miles O'Keefe comes direct from the acclaim for his portrayal of Tarzan to create a new hero, a master of a world of magic and mystery, a mighty swordsman in a fantastic land of monsters and demons where only the strong survive and the weak face the wrath of the Iron Warrior. Welcome to a legend. A land where evil has domain. The kingdom you stole from me will soon be mine once more. It all begins! When a princess has been captured in a land of dungeons Magic. and sorcery of fire and ice. Here, one man must be chosen. We must fight fire with fire. I have to the puny one. For a deadly quest. You must go to Stimmy, the island beneath the waves. Here, one man must face evil incarnate. The demon known as Iron Warrior.
called Arthur. The Legend. Iron Warrior. And welcome back, ladies and gents. So, yeah, you've just seen the trailer for Iron Warrior. So, let's give you some details on this movie, in particular this release, which um, I got the one with the slipcase, so I don't know if that is a limited run. I dare say we usually find out the details on here. Calling it this 1987, so I think He-Man was out by then, so that would kind of make sense. But, yeah, if you buy this version, you'll get a lovely little slip. You will also get in here the reversible sleeve that you always get with alternate art um, as standard and you also get generally on their original releases a booklet. Sometimes you get a poster but those tend to be on the the more collector's ones or the very limited ones which makes me think this one maybe wasn't. It's uh, so like I said before this is 82 in the Italian collection now so my god, we've done a lot of these. And let me give you some information as listed on this one. While I'm reading this off, we'll probably just put up stills from the movie and the artwork. And you can see that so you don't have to watch me painfully read the back of a cover. So let's do that. Miles O'Keefe, who was in Tarzan the Ape Man and Sword of the Valiant and the Lone Runner and Blade Master, returns as Ator or Ator in this thrilling adventure where he teams up with the beautiful Savina Gershak of Beyond the Door 3, Curse 2, The Bite and The Lone Runner to fight an evil sorceress and a deadly swordmaster. Features include a limited edition slipcase with art by Daniel Ibanez, so it was a limited edition, uh, a limited edition booklet notes by Barry Forshaw, high definition Blu-ray 1080p presentation, 2.0 English mono, 2.0 Italian mono with English subtitles, an audio commentary with Eugenio Ercolani and Nani Britti. There is a feature called The Directing Producer, which is an interview with Ovidio Asotitis, I think that's how you pronounce that, Framing the Warrior, an interview with Alfredo Al Aldolfo, Aldolfo Bartioli, Ovidia's Henchman's, which is an interview with Maurizio Maggi, uh, the original trailer, and the reversible sleeve featuring original poster artwork. So yeah, The Iron Warrior. Um, so I didn't know what to expect with this one. I'll be honest with you, I'm picking it back up again. The artwork for this is absolutely rad. Like, instantly I was like, this could be really, really cool. I love the occasional Sword and Sandals movie. Um, fantasy stuff as well. Uh, I grew up in a lot of fantasy movies, especially 80s fantasy, which is arguably the best decade for, like, full-on, like, over-the-top fantasy cinema. I also get a little bit apprehensive when it comes to Italian, specifically Italian 80s movies, because they did become a bit of a, we'll just take a little bit of this blockbuster movie, and a little bit of this one, and a little bit of this one, and we'll cram them all in, whether they fit adjacently or not, into one movie, and then we we'll just release it, and everyone will be happy, because no one would be unhappy with that, it's going to make everyone smile, and very few times have they actually worked cohesively. Like, the elements themselves work fine, and if they expanded on that it'd be cool. But the danger is always, is this going to hang together cohesively? And Iron Warrior is a bit of a mixed bag, in that some of the stuff that they pull off in this movie uh, are, are absolutely brilliant, and it does, it is kind of reminiscent at times of Conan the Barbarian. There's a little bit, to be honest, there's a little bit of, um, Superman, you know, like the, uh, Superman 2, technically. Um, with, with the whole banishment of Zod, although I think that is Superman 1, but then we get to Superman 2 where we get more, it's expended out more, it's a while since I've seen those movies, but like the, the banishment of essentially people that are superhuman, um, that, that idea, that's kind of recreated in this movie, and as poorly fashioned as the recreation is, they go for it and it's kind of phenomenal and it kind of makes me just wish there'd been a whole movie of that. Um, so they did that bit. Uh, I like the, the actual idea of the kind of general story. It's kind of cool. It's about these supernatural deities, these gods, so to speak, um, who are in a kind of... Not quite a wager. Actually, there might be a little bit of Clash of the Titans in this one. I'm thinking about it as well. A lot You can see they just pulled in from all sources. This idea of kind of pitting... Um, 
like immortal beings against each other and he struggled for supremacy in, in this grand stage of, of Earth. And this is done by manipulation. Essentially, you have two twin boys at the beginning. I'm assuming they're twins because that would explain later on. And one of them is kidnapped by this evil uh, sorceress and the other one is retained by this good sorceress and they're brought up apart from each other for 18 years Ator being the main guy who actually also I think plays the reveal of himself as the evil part it's a messy review already uh, in the reveal but I don't think he plays him in full regalia I think that's another actor which would explain the fight scenes um, but basically what you have is these brothers are separated they have no knowledge of each other both trained to be amazing swordsmen and then 18 years later when the the curse 18 years doesn't feel like a long time to banish an immortal but um, the curse is lifted they are on a trajectory to each other with essentially only one being uh, there can be only one um, it's not Highlander so don't worry they did not do a Highlander rip off which is kind of amazing uh, so yeah they're, they're, they're kind of coming for each other in the background there are these supernatural entities at play kind of forging the stage of battle um, some of the action is fine in this it's a bit slowed down like when you watch Conan which is the one I'm going to refer to a lot because Aitor's sword looks like Conan's sword um, and even the way he holds it at times we, I, I, our introduction to him as a grown character is doing the old Conan kind of swordy thing on a hillside overlooking a beautiful um, ocean view it's it's very cinematic but it's also you can see very very quickly it does not have the poise and grace of an Arnold Schwarzenegger um, and that kind of is all the way through this like Arnie's not the greatest actor by any stretch of the imagination certainly wasn't when he played Conan but he makes this guy look like like a terrible 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 actor and I don't think he is He's got a very visually striking look, like a kind of model's body and a very kind of chiselled face, but he doesn't have any personality. In fact, he's devoid of personality through this entire movie, and I'm not saying it is a movie that requires the lead to be charismatic, but, I mean, it helps a little bit. Um, alongside him is this princess, who he is trying to rescue, who the evil sorceress is trying to snuff out so she can assume control of the kingdom question marks never really expressly detailed out um, and this actress whose name was it's not in the box this actress whose name was Savina Gershak um, is stunning like absolutely beautiful and because this is Italian movies from the 80s she reveals quite a bit. There's a lot of, oh, I'm just going to put this dress on, which is completely see-through, because uh, that's practical. And can this visually strike an luminous pink makeup, which is weirdly coloured in, so she's got one eyebrow, which is pink, and this mark on the side of her face, which is adjacent, kind of like something from a New Romantics um, pop video. Uh, kind of, it fades to grey, but pink. And... She's fine as a as a leading woman in a movie like this. She's actually a really good actress for what she's at being asked to do, and I think she delivers it convincingly. The whole movie is stolen by the older actress that plays the sorceress, who is done up in almost full grot bags, which is a Scottish reference if you grew up in Scotland. Almost full grot bags makeup. She's like a cross between grot bags and the the Verdelac that Boris Karloff plays in um, Black Sabbath. Uh, kind of like really overdone lots of weird lights on her face to accentuate the, the kind of prosthetic makeup she's got on it, it's, it's really cool she's excellent in this there is a, a conceit in this movie though about how her mortality works, it doesn't make any sense at all and by the time I got to the end of this movie I was just like I have not a clue how we got here the movie kind of plays footloose and fancy free with um, Star Wars and that the when the two brothers fight, one of them is breathing like Darth Vader. He is wearing a mask, which is like a silver skull equivalent to Darth Vader's mask. And even their fight scenes are delivered in such a way, which is kind of... They may as well be holding lightsabers. Um, and 
To its credit, this movie has a wickedly fast runtime. This is over and out the way in an hour and a half, mercifully in an hour and a half. And because it has that wicked fast runtime, you would think plenty of opportunity just to give us fight scene, set up the next fight scene, which they kind of do. It's all building to set pieces where there's a bit of a tussle, a bit of a sword fight, and then we move on to the next scene. But what I found was I actually expected more fighting. Like, there's not a ton of violence in this movie overall, and it did make me wonder, you've got the people there dressed up as extras, they clearly are doing minimal choreography when it comes to the fight scene, so just give us more of those, and it might make your movie go a little bit quicker, because whenever that's not there, you're kind of forced to focus on the plot, of which it is so paper thin that you can almost shoot peas through it. Um, So that didn't really necessarily help it either. So, yeah, relatively short run time, paper-thin story, individual set pieces that I thought were really well done for the time period and the clearly minuscule budget. Um, But on the flip side of that, I mean, they are essentially just recreations of other much more successful movies that when you're watching this, you're kind of just, oh, Conan did that better, Star Wars did it better. There is a scene where a character is chased by a giant boulder. I mean... How very Indiana Jones. How do you top that? Well, actually, this scene has another giant boulder that just shows up to chase another person. It's that sort of thing where you're like, these movies that it's referencing are older than this and somehow better than this. And granted, they have a larger budget, but it did kind of stand out that way. Last thing I'll mention is the score, which was surprisingly beige for a movie like this. I expected something with a lot of oomph a little bit of pomp and circumstance, so to speak, and it's not really in there either. It's surprisingly unmemorable. I got to the end of it and I, I realised that I hadn't even spent that much time going, this soundtrack is pretty cool, which I'll do, even if I'm not enjoying Italian cinema, there's a chance that there'll be a bit and the score will kick in and I'll be like, this is this is why I love this era and this, you know, this locale of cinema. I didn't really have that either in here. So ultimately, what you're left with is a, a, a pretty mixed bag with more negatives than positives overall. And turning my attention to... I will say the print is great. 88 Films delivered on that and they've been delivering on that pretty successfully now for the last couple of years. They've really raised their game. Some of those early ones are pretty rough but they've found their stride with it. I thought, you know what? We'll spend a bit of time working our way through the special features which are also surprisingly not that great. Um... I don't know what I was expecting in terms of depth and maybe there are a lot of people that were involved with this project that are just not communicable anymore because they passed on or they just don't want to speak about that part of their life anymore but it is surprisingly scant when it comes to special features especially with the recent ones where I feel like I've been almost showered and embarrassed by the riches brought upon me in the Blu-ray. This one doesn't have that at all. So ultimately, what I was left with at the end of Iron War is I would give it a 2 out of 5. I didn't really like it, if I'm honest. There are elements that I thought were cool, but overall, it's not a satisfying watch by any stretch of the imagination. On top of that as well, what I would say is, like, I think I spent like 1999 for this title. Um, and in hindsight, I would probably hold off until it was in the sale. So if you're a completionist, um, who can hold off a little bit for it to come down, do that. It's not worth £20 at all. Uh, learn from my mistakes so you don't make the same mistakes, ladies and gents. So there we go. That was Iron Warrior, disc number 83, uh, 82, sorry, in the Italian collection. And um, yeah, the next time I'm back doing one of these will be disc number 83, which I don't know what that title is yet, but if it's out, I will be getting it. And we'll be carrying on with these reviews and catching back up with where we are on these. On another note, and before I get into all the blurb that comes at the end of these videos about how you can subscribe and stuff. um, If you are checking this out on YouTube, then you may be thinking to yourself, why hasn't he done the Slasher Classics yet? I have technically done all the Slasher Classics on my podcast from 88 Films, all 50 of them. It's my intention over the next couple of months to be putting them up very similar to a lot of the early Italian collection ones where you'll get the audio from them on YouTube and I'll group them together in a playlist so you can go through that one. There's a lot of movies in that collection I really didn't like. So yeah, that'll be fun. I'll be fun revisiting those. So yeah, 
We'll keep your eyes peeled for the Slasher Classics collection, all 50 reviews, making their way to a YouTube near you. Thanks very much for checking out this review. We will be back doing more of this real soon. I've got a screener actually for a brand new title that comes out on Friday. That review will be dropping before Friday in advance of that title. I will be giving no more details about that uh, because I have it in my head what the title is and I've been getting it wrong all week and rather than record it wrong and then have to edit that, we're not doing that. So yeah, thank you very much for checking out this review. As always, if you're checking us out on YouTube, please like, subscribe, hit the bell, that way you get notifications as soon as I drop a brand new review. Also, on top of that, um, leave me a comment. If you've seen The Iron Warrior, did you grow up watching The Iron Warrior? Is it a favourite of yours or do you not like it? kind of like where I land, please let me know in the comments below. If you are on Spotify or the Anchor app, so you can do the video podcast thing over there, uh, make sure you're subscribed and answer the question that pops up at the end of these episodes. And of course, lastly, if you check out the audio version of this on any of the podcatchers out there in the, the internet, then please make sure you're subscribed. That way you get access to the over 1,300 episodes in the back catalogue of Podcasts Under the Stairs and of course, all future episodes which will be dropping your way. Lastly, let me see once again, thank you for checking out this video. Wherever you are, whatever the time zone is, and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours, please take care of yourselves out there. This is Duncan McLeish broadcasting live from under the stairs, and I am signing off.